Greetings, everyone. Dr. B here again, talking about module six. This is the second module six video. And last time I had my Harry Potter shirt on, but I did switch to my May the Force Be With You shirt. Seems very appropriate for this module. Um, I know you've seen that shirt before in video, I think it was 3.01. Uh, but anyhow, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so again, this is module six which is chapter four in your OpenStax physics book. All right, Newton's first law of motion. Okay, and there are three laws of motion. Uh, then there's a law of gravitation, uh, which we're not gonna get into in this video. Newton also had a law of cooling and other things, but we're just sticking to the three laws of motion. All right, what does it say? Basically, objects tend to keep doing what they were doing. And the more inertia something has, the harder it is to change what the object is doing. And remember, when you're changing what the object is doing, you're changing its velocity, which means that the object is accelerating. Okay. Keep in mind, as we talked about in the last video, acceleration is not a force. Okay. It's a property of the object. Okay. You can think of it as an object's laziness. All right. If you have a train and a tricycle, sorry for the fuzzy pictures, but you get the idea and they were both coming towards you, coasting at five miles per hour, which one would you rather step in front of? Hopefully you are saying the tricycle because it would be a lot easier to slow down and even stop the tricycle rather than the train. All right, which one's harder to get into motion? The train, okay, if that train was sitting there, even just the engine and no brake or anything on, level ground, be really hard to get that thing into motion, even if it was on a completely frictionless set of wheels, which would be you know difficult to do. But even without friction, it would be really hard to get that thing up to five miles per hour, as an example. Um, tricycle, that'd be easy, a lot easier to get up to five miles per hour. And then also the one that's not mentioned here, the other kind of acceleration, it's also easier to change the direction of the tricycle. If it was in motion, it'd be a lot easier to change its direction than the railroad, even if it wasn't on tracks, even if it was just cruising along on flat ground and no, no tracks. Okay, so why? Well, because this has more mass, it has more inertia, okay? Remember that inertia is the tendency of an object to continue what it's already doing, same speed, same direction. All right, now let's take a moment to think about the difference between mass and weight, because this is something that's pretty important. And there's a Eureka video here uh, that's that's wor well worth watching. It's an old, old video, but really gets across the point quite clearly. Uh, we'll just go through the highlights. Mass is how much matter is in the object. It's a property of the object. It doesn't change whether you're on the moon or on Mount Everest or on the moon or anywhere else. Mass is not a force, as units kilograms. Weight, on the other hand, is a measure not of the amount of matter in the object, but of how big the gravitational force is acting on that object. Not a property of the object, okay? Because, well, it can change with location. So if it's a property of the object, it wouldn't change with location. Uh, weight is a force. As you'll recall from the last video, weight is synonymous with the force of gravity and has units in newtons. Okay, so these last two things are, are highlighted because if you don't remember anything else from this slide, remember that mass has units of kilograms and weight has units of newtons. Okay, and that'll help you keep them, keep them uh, separate, distinct. All right, oh, sorry about that. Understanding weight and mass. Uh, if a woman's weight is 550 newtons on Earth, what's her mass? Well. On your equation sheet, you'll see that in the, in the chapter four section, you'll see weight equals mg, w equals mg. So if weight is 550 newtons, and you set that equal to m times the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.8. So 550 newtons equals m times 9.8. Then we divide both sides by 9.8. 56.1 kilograms is her mass. All right, what would her mass be on the moon? Remember, mass is a property of the object, so it would still be 56.1 kilograms. What's her weight on the moon? 
well, 56 point, remember weight is mg, so 56.1 kilograms times, what's the local acceleration due to gravity on the moon? About 1.67. So we take 56.1 multiplied by 1.67. Her weight would be only about 93.7 newtons on the moon versus 550 newtons here. So you can see weight does change with location. Okay, it's not a property of the object. All right, and what would her weight be on Mars? Well, 56.1 kilograms times whatever the acceleration due to gravity on the on Mars is, which is about 3.3. Uh, you can look that up. All right, more examples um, of this and, and thinking about how this is gonna look in problems. Okay, here it said the woman's weight is 550 newtons, but what if it just said a 50 newton box or a 50 kilogram sled? How are you gonna know whether they've given you the weight or the mass of the box? The weight or the mass of the sled? It's quite easy. Remember that last line on the weight versus mass slide? If it's in newtons, it's the weight. If it's in kilograms, it's the mass. Now, be careful. This tension force, okay, that's that's not a weight. Okay, so yeah, you, you have to be careful, but like that's clearly a tension force. Um, but in terms of describing the object, here they've given the mass. So the mass of the sled is 50 kilograms. The weight of the sled would just be 50 kilograms times 9.8, which is 490 newtons. If the box has a weight of 50 kilograms, then 50 divided by 9.8, so 5.1 kilograms. Now, you don't have to memorize when to divide, when to multiply. You don't have to guess. Just look on your equation sheet. The equation is W equals mg. It's right there. So you can just use that equation. W stands for weight, M stands for mass, G stands for the acceleration due to gravity. The magnet, I'm sorry, the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. All right, so you don't have to guess. Use your equation sheet. All right. More on Newton's first law. So not recommended. In the absence of a net external force, an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion continues in motion with constant velocity. All right, this is kind of similar to what most people have in their head already, if you have anything in your head related to the first law. Okay, an object at rest stays at rest, an object in motion continues in motion. That's probably how you would have said it and you would have left out this underlined part, which is the part that gives it meaning. Okay, without that, then you lose all the important meaning of it and you can misinterpret it all kinds of different ways. So if you're gonna remember it this way, you gotta remember those last three words. Simple as that, okay? If you don't remember the last three words, it is very, 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 very likely you're gonna misinterpret it and, and get things wrong uh, when you're doing homework, problems, quiz problems, et cetera. Okay, so just to show you, say, oh, well, a ball is thrown off a cliff at a 45 degree angle, blah, blah, blah. So I guess it just stays in motion forever, huh? And it, no, because it's actually slowing down as it goes up and it's speeding up as it comes down and then it's stopping when it hits the ground. So that's the, the first law. If, if we think about it this way, especially without the constant velocity part, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, this whole statement is correct, so we can think about it, applying it to this situation. In the absence of a net external force, well, if the ball is thrown off the cliff, are there any external forces acting? Okay, well, not the force of the hand, that, that already happened. Once it's in motion, what's acting? The force of gravity. So the net force is not zero, it has an external force acting on it, and that's why the object does not move at a constant velocity. So by remembering these last three words, we can say, oh, that makes sense. There is a net external force and it does not move with constant velocity. Okay, so we can apply that. We just, it, it, it's a lot more difficult. Okay, so what, what's, the, what's an easier way to understand what the first law says? So if the net force is zero, then the acceleration is zero, okay? That, I don't know why that's all the way over there in the corner. But anyway, um, the net force is zero, then acceleration is equal to zero. Now, let's, let's look into an example. The Voyager space probes, and there's a goofy little graphic. They're, they're moving each one, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they're both moving roughly 35,000 miles per hour. 
they both left the solar system. Um, the forces of gravity acting on them from the sun, the earth, Jupiter, other stars, very, 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 very small because they're so far away from all of those things. There's no friction because they're not rubbing on any surfaces. There's no air resistance because they're not going through air. They're going through empty space and there's no tension because there's no ropes attached to them. Um, so all they're really encountering are very, 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 very small forces of gravity. And so what are they doing? They're traveling at a constant velocity. How do they do that? That's just what things do. So this is really important that you recognize that the natural thing that that objects do is to keep doing exactly what they were doing. So if five seconds ago they were moving at 35,000 miles per hour, that's what they're doing now, unless some external force has intervened to speed them up or slow them down or to change their direction. So they don't need any fuel to keep doing what they're doing. Okay. It would take an a force to get them to change what they're doing. Okay. Same thing is true here on Earth. If I take a textbook and I push it across the desk, well, it wasn't moving before I pushed it. It took a net external force to get the book into motion. That was me pushing on it. And it takes a net external force to slow it down. Okay. But that net external force is there. As soon as I stop pushing, you can see the effects of friction, which were acting the whole time it was in motion. And so friction slows it down. There's a net external force when I'm pushing on it that's speeding it up. And as soon as I stop pushing on it, friction starts to slow it down. So the first law is just as true here on Earth as it is for these Voyager space probes. Um, it's just that on Earth, we think of the baseline as, oh, we have to keep pushing on something to keep it at a constant velocity. But that's only because of friction and air resistance. Okay. So if we strip everything away and we think of the Voyager space probes as our baseline, when no forces are acting, objects move at a constant velocity, okay? And then we add a single force, we know that we're gonna have a changing velocity. If we have two or more forces, well, they might be balanced or they might be unbalanced. If they're balanced, that means the object's gonna keep doing what it's doing. If the forces are unbalanced, the object is changing what it's doing. And here we have that summarized. So this is a much better way to think about the first law than that long definition that ended with at constant velocity. Uh, you'll see constant velocity is still part of this. Uh, really, you just need to remember the first bullet point. When the forces are balanced, the object has a constant velocity or vice versa. If the forces are unbalanced, then the object has a changing velocity. So you don't necessarily have to member, memorize the second bullet point because it's just the opposite of the first one. Okay, so for something to have a constant velocity, the forces have to be balanced. These two things are linked together. Okay, you can't have one of these without the other. Okay, and these two things are linked together. You can't have one of these without the other. Okay, anything that has a changing velocity has unbalanced forces. Anything with unbalanced forces has a changing velocity. And then same thing for constant velocity. Any object that's moving at a constant velocity definitely has balanced forces. And anything with balanced forces definitely has a changing velocity. I'm oh, sorry, constant velocity. Ha, I missed it. Sorry about that. All right. Newton's first law always applies. All of the laws always apply. Okay. You'll find certain websites, videos, et cetera, where they're like, oh, well, this law applies to this situation and this law applies to this other situation. That's not a good way to look at it. All of the laws apply all the time. Okay, so you want to be really careful if you're watching videos or seeing websites where they're saying it like that. Um, it takes a little more sophistication to understand how they all apply all the time, uh, but they do. But as far as the first law goes, any object at a certain time can always be fit into one of those two bullet points. It's either one or the other. You're all, either all in on the first one or it's all in on the second one. It's not a mix and match thing. Newton's second law of motion. Ugh, a lot of words. Or the symbol. Okay, we're going to look at this one first. The acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. Okay, summation of forces, the Greek letter sigma, summation of forces, or we can call it the net force. Okay, so the bigger the net force, the bigger the acceleration. That's what's meant by directly proportional. 
it's in the same direction, meaning the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. And then the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. Okay. And then I just realized what is missing are the vector hats, which it's not letting me draw. All right, there we go. I don't know why I couldn't draw on the screen, but now I fixed them so they have their vector hats in there. So net force and acceleration are both vectors and they're in the same direction. Uh, and then the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the object, meaning the more mass the object has, the lower the acceleration will be for a certain amount of force. Okay, so if you were to apply the same amount of force to both of these carts, you'd see a this one has a much bigger acceleration. So a lower mass, bigger acceleration. Those are inversely proportional. Um, or if we were just using two empty carts and we applied more force to one, we'd see that the one that we applied more force to would have the bigger acceleration. That's what's meant by directly proportional. All right, uh, this, is, this is the form we commonly use for calculations. This is really the form you should use when you're doing conceptual questions it's trust me all right uh, if we think about some experiments more experiments with carts this is really basically what i was saying on the last slide with respect to the shopping carts but if we use some frictionless carts which if uh, you were in the in-person uh, course you would see we, we have examples of these in the classroom in the lab room uh, but if we had two frictionless carts that both had the same mass but we apply twice as much force to cart one to speed it up, what would the result be? Well, cart one is going to have twice the acceleration. Not too surprising. Test two, if we have two carts that instead of having the same mass, this time we're applying the same horizontal force to both of them, but cart one has twice the mass. What's going to happen? Well, if cart one has twice the mass, that means cart one's acceleration is going to be one half as big. Okay. So more mass leads to lower acceleration for a given force. And then test three, cart one has a certain mass, certain force acting on it. And then cart two has three times as much mass as cart one and three times as much horizontal force exerted on it. What's gonna happen then? Well, in that case, they're gonna have the exact same acceleration. So that's a case where we have vastly different forces acting, but two things have the same acceleration. Have we ever seen that in this course? Yeah, think about back to module three, where we had a paper ball and a shoe. A shoe has many times more force acting on it than a uh, paper ball, but the shoe fell at the same rate as the paper ball. Even though the force of gravity on the shoe might have been 50 or 100 times more, it's not about just the force, it's the force and the mass. It's the ratio of force to mass. And we can see that right here. Okay, so what determines the acceleration is the ratio of force to mass. So in experiment three on this slide, as well as the, the shoe and paper ball example, it's the same ratio of force to mass. And that's why those things have the same acceleration. All right, here's some examples of using the second law. The first one, you just might look at it and you're like, oh, 70 is the acceleration and uh, 45,000 is the uh, mass. You're just like, oh, I'm just going to multiply those together. And you get a force of 3,150,000 newtons. That'd be correct. That's how much thrust you need. So what I don't want you to do is get in the habit of just picking up your calculator and just starting to plug in some numbers. Okay? What you really need to do for this unit, just like modules two, three, and four, is to draw a diagram, use your equation from your equation sheet, and go step by step. So looking at this second one, We've got a um, car speeding up at a rate of five meters per second squared. We know the mass of the car, and we're trying to figure out how much force uh, the car needs if there's 380 newtons of drag. So step one, well, I actually already did it for you, um, is to draw the free body diagram. So we learned about these in the last video. So what's acting? Well, we start with the non-contact force, the force of gravity down here. And then we think about what's touching it. 
Okay, well, the road is touching it and pushing up. There's a normal force. Um, somehow there's some applied force, the, the uh, force from the engine. There's lots of different ways to think about this. So cars are actually a little bit complicated. So we're not gonna get into too much about how this happens. Um, but there, you, we all know that there's a force applied to make the car go. So we'll call that the applied force. And then here's the drag force. Um, and this has to do with, because the air is touching the car. All right, so we got our free body diagram. Next, we pick a coordinate system. We'll pick up to be the positive y direction to the right to be the positive x direction. Now we get an equation from the equation sheet. Summation of forces in the x direction equals m times a sub x. Missing my vector hats again on those, sorry. Um, now we put in the magnitude of the applied force minus the magnitude of the drag force equals mass times the acceleration. Step by step, okay? Write down what I'm doing. This is the equation from the equation sheet. Don't skip this, okay? Fill in the forces from the free body diagram using the what I picked as my positive x direction. So don't ignore this. Look at this, okay? Then we go to the next step. And put F applied minus, I know the value for this, 380 Newtons. The mass is 1,000 kilograms, the acceleration positive five meters per second squared because the car is moving to the right and speeding up. So both its um, velocity and acceleration are to the right. So the acceleration gets a positive sign. Then we do the algebra and we get an answer of 5,380 Newtons. Okay. Now I said not skip any steps. If, if you wanted to, you could do, you, you could skip this, this second line here but always tell me what equation you're using from the equation sheet. Show me and then fill it in, okay? The forces go on the left side, okay? So whether this is your next line or this is your next line, the left side should have only forces and the right side should only have mass and acceleration, okay? Like I said, whether it's this one is the next line or this one, make sure you keep forces on the left, mass times acceleration on the right. Okay. Now, mass times acceleration does end up with units of force, but this is mass. This is the actual acceleration of the object. Okay. So that's just an example of how we can use the second law. Under the student note packet, there's lots more videos of, of how to do more complex problems and just more and more problems. All right, Newton's third law of motion. This is probably what you've heard. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, that's probably going to lead you astray most of the time. I've seen it over and over and over again. So you can use that. Um, I just want you to understand what's really going on. And I, I want you to get the right answers. So here's another one. This is longer, unfortunately, but it tells us a lot of important information. So whenever an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first object. All right. So what's different about that definition? First of all, this one, it's not clear that we're talking about two objects that are interacting with each other. And that's, I, that's one of the problems. I've been doing this a long time. So you, you can tr take my word for it or not, but, but understanding that there's two objects involved is, is really important. Think back to the prior video where the swimmer was pushing on the wall and the wall was pushing on the swimmer. Two objects involved, the swimmer and the wall. The other thing that's not clear in this first definition is that we're talking about forces. You might, you might apply it to, oh, I punched my brother and he punched me back. Well, okay, there's actually some force in there, but it's not in the right way, okay? That's talking about two things that are happening at two different times. The third law is talking about two things that are happening simultaneously. So if you wanted to apply it, you could say, I punched my brother, and as my fist pushed on his cheek, his cheek was pushing on my hand with an equal amount of force. Okay, so see how that's different? Okay, if you punch your brother, he might punch you back harder than you punched him. And you're like, how does that fit with the third law? Well, you're not applying it right. Remember, when you're pushing on his cheek, his cheek is pushing on you just as hard as you're pushing on his cheek. So that's how the third law gets applied. Let's look at some more examples. Well, before we do that, let's look at how do we do this thing called identifying a third law pair. 
That's something that you're going to be required to do. That's one of the skills of this module. Figure out what is it that's interacting. Identify the two objects involved. If you can do that, then you can say, oh, well, what's the action force? That's just the first force listed. Object A exerts a force on object B in the blank direction. And then the reaction force is easy. Object B exerts a force on object A in the opposite direction. Okay, but you would actually fill in the object names. You would put in directions like to the right, to the left, like that. Okay, that's called an action reaction pair, or most of the time, I just call it a third law pair. So let's look at how this works. The man pushes to the right on the punching bag. The punching bag pushes on the man to the left. That's a third law pair. And when I ask you to write it out, to, to spell it out in long form, like you're going to do in the packet, like you're going to do on your expert TA homework in, in at least one place, that's what I want. Here we have uh, the dog pulling kind of diagonally down into the right, and the man is pulling diagonally up into the left with the same amount of force. Okay, on this one, the rocket pushes gases downward, and the gases push the rocket upward. That's how thrust works. Tug of war. Oh, how does that work? Because this team pulls to the left on the rope, and this team pulls to the right on the rope with the same amount of force. So how do you win? Well, you win by having more friction. Okay. Because the time when you start losing, let's say this ended up being the losing team. The time when you start losing is when the force that is being exerted on the rope to the left on this team is greater than the force of static friction acting to the right on this team. Okay, At least that's one way you can lose. The other way you can lose is by being toppled over. So that means you're not in rotation, rotational equilibrium. And that we'll, we'll do in module 12 much later. But I like to think about it just when the, for, for right now, is when the friction, the maximum amount of static friction for this team is less than how hard the other team is pulling on the rope. Because both teams are pulling on the rope with equal amount of force. Ah, hurt your brain, I know. Okay, what about a baseball while it's falling? Let's even make it in a vacuum, okay? It's falling in a vacuum. What's the third law pair? Hmm. The force of gravity and the force of air resistance? No. First of all, those are both acting on the baseball. Secondly, there's no air in a vacuum, so it can't be that. So what is it? Well, if we if we can write out one of the forces for any of these, if we can write out one of the forces fully, then the, the other one becomes very easy. So what is it? What, what is the force of gravity? Well, the force of gravity is actually the earth pulling down on the baseball. So the third law pair to that is the baseball pulling up on the earth, okay? And those two forces are equal. Like, wait a minute, how can those be equal? How can the baseball pull on the earth just as hard as the earth pulls on the baseball? Well, it's, it's true by Newton's third law, but does it make sense? Well, we know the baseball is accelerating down at 9.8 meters per second squared. So whatever that force is, okay, maybe like, let's see, how big is it? Um, 0.145 newtons, I think, is, is about how big the, the force of gravity is of how hard the Earth's pulling on the baseball. Okay, then we divide that by the object's mass, which is about 140 some kilo, uh, grams, or 0.145 um, kilograms. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I said, so the force of gravity on the baseball is about 1.45 newtons. Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, and the mass is about 0.14 something kilograms. So if we divide those, we get 9.8 meters per second squared. And then I said the baseball is pulling up on the earth just as hard. So that means the baseball is pulling up on the earth with a force of 1.45 newtons. And what does the earth do? The earth doesn't seem to move, right? Well, second law, acceleration equals net force over mass, just like I did for the baseball. Let's do it for the earth. So 1.45 Newtons pulling upward on the, on the Earth. And then we divide that by the Earth's mass. Now, I don't remember what the Earth's mass is, but it's some gigantic number. You can look it up. 
Okay, so take 1.45 and then divide it by that number you look up for the mass of the Earth. Type it into your calculator. Chances are you're going to get zero. Now, it's not exactly zero, but it's really, 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 really close to zero. And your calculator might just tell you that it's zero or it might give you a really small number. Okay, it might say something times 10 to the minus big number, which means 0 0.00000000000000 something. Okay is the acceleration of the Earth in meters per second squared due to the baseball pulling up on it. That's believable that it's either zero or really, really small. OK, so I know it's a lot to take in, but it actually does all fit together and it does fit in with our observations. All right, so if things are different masses, is the third law still true? Absolutely. That's what I was just talking about with respect to the Earth and the baseball. But same thing, if the windshield, so you've heard the saying, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. Well, when the windshield pushes on the bug, the bug pushes back on the windshield with just as much force. Doesn't mean the damage is going to be the same to both, but the, the amount of force is the same in both cases. Same thing for a cannonball being fired out of a cannon. The force of the cannon on the cannonball is equal to the force of the cannonball on the cannon, but that doesn't mean they're both going to travel equal distances in opposite directions because the cannon has more mass, so its acceleration is not going to be as big. All right, Newton's laws in summary. Okay, just really quickly to recap. I know it's already a long video, but recapping. Instead of saying that definition with the object at rest, yada yada. Think of it like this, okay? Instead of just F equals MA, think of it as summation of forces. And then, so that's what the sigma means. Remember, we can do it. We can apply this in the X direction and we can apply it in the Y direction, okay? We can also write it for concept, thinking about it conceptually, write about it as acceleration equals force over mass, okay? And then, Instead of the action reaction definition, think about it like this. All right, that's it for this video. If you have questions, you know where to find me. I look forward to talking to you.